homeostasis. What is needed to maintain homeostasis for the individual is also established in society, at the societal level. And I think this is very, very important right now to bring up because the way society is around us, it is an extension of the individual's needs, of what the individual needs to maintain their homeostasis. The reason everything is happening, the reason we have the patterns of work and rest and the foods we eat, the ways we blow off stress, the ways, all these things that we do as a society are extensions of what individuals need. An individual can't live in a society that isn't meeting their needs or is a threat to their stability. And I bring this up because this is what neurodiverse people are trying to do. This is what they are faced with from birth. They are in an environment that is not keeping them stable on a, homo, on a homeostasis level. Of course, it's homeostasis and everything out becomes emotional, psychological, you know, the whole thing. So, so society has evolved to meet the NT needs, and this is where the vacuum is for the needs for, in, for neurodiverse people. We need this in our society, the place that maintains our homeostasis. Homeostasis is brought about by a neurological resistance to change in the optimal conditions. You're instinctually on a certain level maintaining your heart rate, your blood pressure, your, your nutrition, your hydration, all these things that are absolutely critical or you die. And they're maintained at a subconscious level. That's why the guy is sitting in the chair with a hurricane coming. Because his subconscious, intuitive, instinctual side says, I'm okay. And this is where I am going to be okay, so I'm not leaving. Not rational. In, in, it's uh, instinctual. And these, this is what ends up becoming a barrier between neurodiverse and neurotypical people. So, balance. If things are in balance, things are normal, and things are okay. Things are imbalanced, my stability is threatened, my life is threatened, that's abnormal. That's a threat. That is a very basic thought process or, you know, the instinct is probably going through this. But what has to be remembered is the normal ways autistic people maintain their homeostasis are often seen as disorders and abnormal behaviors by NTs on an instinctual, even an, and an intellectual, rational level. It's a threat. We're, see, we're seen as a threat to the homeostasis. And when a person is threatened, when an organism, any organism is threatened, it goes into the state of fight, flight, or freeze. And this, uh, this one chart, uh, it elaborates on that. Um, of what happens physiologically once you're in your green zone as this uh, chart is showing that you're in joy, you're in the present, you're grounded, you're curious and open, you're compassionate, you're mindful. Life is good. And the line above that which waves is showing that, yeah, you kind of, you go in and out of that. Life isn't this one humming along straight line that you're in the, you're in the green zone. You've, there's challenges all the time. In fact, I say the more the challenges that are made, that are you can cope with, the better, because that gets you that you're more flexible in your ability to maintain your homeostasis. This is what's wrong. This is what happens though with people that are autistic, is that they're way too long and often in the fight flight mode, and they don't get back down in their green so they can stay there. Okay, 
So our neurology sets and regulates our homeostasis. Bing, 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 bing. Autistic and neurotypical people have a different homeostasis. We have different needs. That is, I think, the point that both communities need to realize. The neurodiverse need to realize it so they realize, look, it's okay that I am autistic. I have to be autistic. I have to acknowledge what my needs are on a physical, biological, instinctual level. That's where my stability is. I need to be autistic. And this is the problem we run into when we try to... It's one thing to take a neurodiverse person and have them learn neurotypical skills. It's another thing to take a neurodiverse person and only give them a neurotypical environment where they cannot maintain their homeostasis. Okay. Why does the difference in neurology affect the ability to relate to each other? There is an instinctual connection between similar neurotypes versus a, 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 a instinctual versus rational, okay? And the best example I can give of what I, an example that shows this bond that you could get when you've got close neurotypes is in this next picture. Identical twins. What do we know? What do we always hear about identical twins talking about the closeness they feel? And I was looking at this photo and I'm going, genetically, they're the same. Physically. And the importance about being physically the same is that any changes in the body affect the perception of life, the senses, their sensory input changes, the shape of the eardrum, the earlobe itself, it's identical on those two. And that means that they're going to hear almost identically the same sounds. Little subtle things make a big difference in that connection. That's why one of these girls can basically know just from the environment what their doppelganger is, is is feeling and thinking. That's I mean the thought processes and I mean the, the 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 how that all coincides. But this is just an example of two very similar neurotypes and how they can relate on an instinctual level to each other. Two very different neurotypes. <laughs> I love this picture. Um, because to me this shows, one, just because you're different neurotypes doesn't mean you can't get along. But the problem is when you think that what you're relating to in life experiences is the same as the other person or the other creature, you know, and the example, I, the reason I put the sense of smell up there is because, you know, I mean, I don't believe the girl there thinks that, uh, hey, this dog's loving this, that we're going to get a picture, and, you know, and then both of our tongues are hanging out. I mean, you know, the dog is not thinking that. Just the difference in the smell, the smell, the, the ability for those two to smell. A dog's sense of smell is, is from a minimum of a thousand times, a thousand times stronger to 10 million times more accurate. And if that doesn't blow you away on an intellectual level, of thinking of like your vision, think of your vision being 10 million times more acute, 10 million times more information in what you see. And tell me then, that you can say 
that dog is experiencing the same thing as that human. You can't intuitively, instinctually relate. Some things you can. There's basics of, are they both fed? Are their bodies saying, I need to eat? No. Oh, okay, good. You know what I mean? So there's, there, are, there are some connections that can be made, but look how basic they are. And this is what I think is the reason that people who are neurotypical might, might, might resist when a neurodiverse person says, look, I can only work part-time and I need to be able to come in when I can come in. What's that? That is <laughs> me trying to not kill myself. I'm being exaggerating there, but just a little. That is me trying to maintain my ability to even function. I'm not doing that because I'm lazy. I'm not doing that because, uh, you know, I mean, no, no, this is, this is different. This is me trying to survive. Okay. That's the point I want to make there. So, neural connection. The, the connection now, if you understand this, the connection then between autistic and neurotypical people is going to be more intellectual and rational than it, will, can, then it can be on a instinctual, intuitive basis because there is less to connect to on those levels. Any instinctual, intuitive connections are going to probably be very basic or, or limited, put it in that way. And this is so important to accept because if you start filling in, oh, oh I know what they feel. No, no, you don't. This is why you've got to, you know, this, this is why you've got to keep that open mind and going, you know, I'm thinking about like you know, kids, you know, that are acting out or whatever. Um, what are they saying? They're saying my 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 homeostasis is fried right now. I need help. Well, the neurotypical person is going. I don't know what to do. I don't know what you're feeling. I don't know what you need right now. And this is this is why I think it's very important for the neurodiverse community to be there as much as we can as sources of information, as advisors, we are going to call it counseling. We need to be there to be able to use our ability to intuitively and instinctually relate to what that child needs to try to solve that problem with solutions that that child needs. <laughs>